Hello and welcome to the First Congregational Church and Society of Ringe, Ringe UCC online worship. This is the third Sunday of Lent and we are so grateful you have joined us. Whoever you are and wherever you are in your journey, you are welcome here in this time. This is a communion Sunday, so I invite you to gather for yourself a cup and something to eat, a cracker or a piece of bread, that you might join us when we have our communion service. And if that doesn't feel right for you, then be with us, listen to the words, and join us in that part of our worship. So please settle in and prepare for worship with us. Join us now in our responsive call to worship and prayer of invocation. Our Lenten journey continues. Often the road has been stony and hard. Sometimes we have stumbled and even fallen. But God has been our friend and our guide. We have no cause to be alarmed. God is faithful to us even when we are faithless. Today we rejoice in God's faithful love and together ask for strength and signs of hope and life. And again, we are drawn together to celebrate the life that is ours in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God. Now, please join us in our invocation. We who have come to know your love, O oh Lord, are here to worship you. We ask your blessing upon us in this offering of our praise, and we ask your presence in every act of our lives, that we, your church, may be confirmed in our faith and give glory to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
morning. The readings for this week are Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, and Mark 11, 15 through 19. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Mark eleven fifteen through 19. And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer? But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and their chief priests heard it, and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him him, because all of the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. The word of the God for people of God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This gospel lesson of Jesus in the temple is so rich. There are so many different lenses to see it through. And it is very well known. It's so well known because this reaction of Jesus to turn over the tables and drive the people away, it was so out of character for him. There are only a few instances in all the four Gospels of Jesus being angry, and this is actually the main one. This story is also one of the few stories that appears in all four of the Gospels. It was striking even to the Gospel writers decades after Jesus had died. Anger causes people to pay attention. More to the point, People acting out of their anger, particularly in a way that disrupts the day-to-day, really causes people to pay attention. Two millennia later, we are still paying attention to this scripture and Jesus' actions. And we are tasked as followers of Jesus to wonder, what does this story mean for us today, in this world, in this time? And as people of Ranj UCC in this Lenten season, we are also tasked with the question, what does it mean for us as we consider courageous covenant with one another, with God, our community, and the world around us? As always, and in any time we read scripture, this comes in a context that is very important. In the Gospel of Mark, the paragraph before describes how Jesus had arrived in Jerusalem the night before and had gone to the temple as the last part of the day and left to go into Bethany where he was staying with the disciples. 
We don't know what he thought. That was just one sentence that happened. But the temple in Jerusalem was one of the holiest places for the people of Jewish faith. And so he wanted to go there directly when he arrived. We don't hear what he thought that night because they all head back. But we do know that the next morning, as they were going back to Jerusalem, he was hungry and he cursed a fig tree because it didn't have any fruit on it. Now here is our first clue that Jesus is upset. He's upset about something and he takes it out on the fig tree. We don't ever read that scripture in our lectionary, but there it is. The first indication that Jesus is upset about something. The next scene after that, he enters into the temple and you know the rest, you just heard it. It seems that Jesus stewed all night about what he saw in the temple how to his mind, it had become about buying and selling, about a market and an economy, and was no longer a place of prayer. It had lost its purpose, what it was built for, for God. And also, as we talk about context, it's important to remember that he had a lot on his plate. He'd been in ministry for years, he knew he was running out of time and he was headed into the lion's den of Jerusalem, enough to make anyone anxious. He knew his life was in danger, that it was in danger for sharing the good news of God's love and mercy. It was in danger because he dared to suggest that the poor and the marginalized had a right to that love and mercy and equality and healing. He had hit his end at this point when he came as a Jewish man into the temple and saw it being used as a marketplace and he got angry. Now we are no strangers to anger today in this world. We are surrounded by anger. So often in these days, I feel like it's people's first response rather than after years. Just try entering some controversial subject on a social media page of some sort, and you will experience an explosion of angry opinions. Sometimes it's really hard to distinguish who agrees with you and who doesn't because the words are just so angry. Our political elections, our town discussions, our cultural disagreements, even food preferences, Everything can create a whirlwind of flipping of tables and whips of words. It's hard for me because you're not here in the room with me, but I'm going to go out on a limb and, and guess that you know what I'm talking about. One of the reasons this story is so well known is because it is out of character of Jesus. I said it at the beginning and I want to repeat that. That's why people sit up and pay attention. It is one of only a few times we see him respond from this place of anger. It's important because it does remind us that being angry is a part of being human, a part of caring in the world. To be angry is not wrong. And indeed, it can fuel some of our good work and propel us into new ways of thinking. It's also, this story is also important because our Savior, the one we follow, did not operate out of this place regularly. He had many opportunities to react from his anger. All the years he ministered, the times he was kicked out of towns and temples, he was ridiculed and challenged by the very people he was trying to save. He had a limit, as do all people, and he flipped the tables in this story. But then he moved on. From that point on, as we read the gospel in that last week of his life, he returned to his focus and his purpose of preaching and teaching out of love, out of God's love. He made his point, and then he stopped operating out of his anger. And he also returned to engage those that he had blown up at. He returned to the temple to talk to the people that he perhaps had driven out that very day. And he spoke to them 
from a place of love and mercy. The very ones who would show up with swords to arrest him, the very ones he protected from the anger of his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane were very likely the ones that he was angry with and toward on that day. As followers of Jesus, we recognize that anger is a part of being human. As people, to be call, as people who are called to be concerned for God's world and all that is in it, we recognize that there is much to be angry about. Part of being in covenant is being able to sit in and with that anger, our own and others, to ask questions about its origin, to not respond in kind when it is thrown at us. In a world of tantrums and angry words, perhaps it is time for the people of God to be curious about it, to wonder about it, to ask about it. The way that we have pondered for so long Jesus's angry reaction in the temple. Courageous covenant means looking into our own anger and asking where is it coming from? and then holding it up into the light of God and God's will for us and asking, what now? It is hard to be in conversation about anger. It is hard to hear why others might be angry. And yet in this world filled with anger, we, are we not called to ask why? Anger comes from many places, from fear, from selfishness, from hate, from feeling out of control or feeling disrespected, it comes from loss. And anger also comes from love. Some of our angry motivations can lead us to destruction and danger. It can be fueled by hatred and fear. And anger born out of love can strengthen our resolve. It can drive us toward making change that can bring about God's realm in this world. If we learn from all that Jesus taught us, we can engage our feelings through the lens of love and work to be God's people. In this week of Lent, let us be curious first about our own anger. Where does it come from? How does it drive us or stand in our way. And let us also be curious about the anger of others. Can we sit with one another, knowing sometimes when others flip the tables, it is because there is something very important to hear? And sometimes we've just gotten so used to speaking and responding in anger, we don't know any other way. Let us model a different way to respond to our anger and others. Let us follow Jesus' way and make love the place that we respond from. I know in this world of anger it may sound foolish and a little scary, but let's give it a try. May it be so. Amen.
Welcome to this communion table, the table that Jesus invites everyone to. Whoever you are, and wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here with us. I invite you to get some bread and juice or a cracker and water, whatever you have, and come to this table, this table of communion, to be with God and one another. Eat this bread, drink this cup, come to him and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in him and you will not thirst. Jesus Christ, Bread of life, those who come to you will not hunger. Jesus Christ, risen Lord, those who trust in you will not thirst. May the God of holy words be with you. May the meditation of our hearts be with us and with God. People of God, open yourselves to the one who is our rock, that God may fill us with foolishness so that we may be wise. Children of God, sing songs of creation with all creation. Our voices are lifted to the one who makes all songs. Let us pray. You spoke those words of creation, God of faithfulness, and set the sun to run its daily course, filled the seas with imaginative creatures, planted fruits and vegetables in the earth. All that is good and generous was intended for your children, shaped in your image. But we bore false witness against you, honoring sin and death more than you. The prophets came to warn against our foolishness, but we did not find their words acceptable, and we continued to covet everything which did not belong to us. So we might find, so you sent your child to us, so we might find strength in his weakness, we might find glory through his humiliation. With those who have great faith, with those who have very little, we sing our thanksgivings to you. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of the mountaintops. The heavens join all creation to tell of your glory, Hosanna, in the highest. Blessed is the one who is foolish for our sake, Hosanna, in the highest. Day to day you are holy, our God, and Jesus Christ declares your wisdom to us. The word of your mouth, he came to tell us of your work of grace and hope. The meditation of your heart, he came to quiet our frantic spirits, so we might rest in you. Your foolishness, he was wise enough to take our sins to the cross. Your weakness, he was strong enough to endure death for us, until you brought him out of the grave. As we remember his zeal for your heart, as we remember his passion for us, we would speak of that mystery we know as faith. Christ died, the rock which broke sin's power. Christ was raised, death conquered by our Redeemer. Christ will return, desiring us more than anything in all creation. We remember that on the night that he was betrayed, he gathered his friends around him. He looked at the table and saw the elements there. And he took the bread, seeking a way to share the truth with his followers. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is like my body. Until bread is broken, it can feed no one. And so my body will be broken so that the world might know God's love. Likewise, he took the cup 
And when he had given thanks in praise, he offered the cup to his disciples and said, This cup is a cup of a new covenant. It is like my blood, which will be poured out for many. For until wine is poured out, it can quench no thirst. And so every time you drink of this cup, remember me and all that I taught you. So we eat this bread and drink this cup that we might remember the covenant through Jesus Christ of God's love and mercy and forgiveness. All is made ready, the gifts of God for the people of God. Take and eat. Let us pray. Here, at this table, God of love, we set aside our power that we might feast on the weakness found in the broken bread. We let go of our wisdom to drink from the cup of your foolish grace. Your spirit blesses these gifts as well as us, so when we have feasted, we will look at the world with its injustices, oppressions, wars, and fears, saying, take these things out of here. Stop making God's creation a house of horrors. And when the sun has finished its course, when the moon and stars shine no more, we will be given the words from your mouth, so we can sing from the depths of our hearts to you, God in community, holy in one. Amen. God speaks and sends us forth. We will go to proclaim God's grace and glory. Jesus speaks and lives are changed. Let us go to set free the oppressed, to be the voice of those never heard from. The Spirit speaks and the world is turned inside out. We will become as foolish as a trusting child, as powerless as those overlooked by everyone around them. Let us go in peace to love and serve our God. Amen. Amen.